I look like. It, it, it doesn't get any better no matter how many times you see it. So I am the, the youngest of four brothers, and we are all represented by this photograph. I'm in the middle at 17. My brother Patrick is on the left. My brother David is on the right. And of course, my brother Brian took the photograph. Now growing up, we were, um, these three were particularly close and we did everything together. Um, some of my first memories are, uh, they revolve around uh, sort of unbelievable sporting events. I remember in 1979, sitting down as a family and watching the Pittsburgh Pirates come back down 3-1 and beating the Baltimore Orioles. And I remember my father, when it was 3-1, he said, this, this series is over, boys. You don't come back from 3-1. Um, but Willie Stargell and Omar Moreno and Dave Parker can name everybody on that team. They came back and they did it. We Are Family was their, was their theme song. And then in 1980, Lake Placid, uh, Eric Hyden comes out and he wins three Olympic gold medals in speed skating. He wins the 500, he wins the 1,000, he wins the 1,500. The guy was a machine and he was American. So it was awesome. And then of course the greatest unfathomable thing is the US Olympic men's hockey team beats the Russians and then they go on to win gold. And so sports represent all that is improbable or even impossible becomes possible through sport. So <clears throat> the brothers, these three in particular, we were always outside um, and we were expected to be. My father didn't want you in the house unless there was a meal or it was bedtime. I don't know why, which is a good thing because there was no, um, there were no computers, there were no cell phones, and there certainly weren't uh, entire stations dedicated to cartoons. So we were very physical um, and uh, and active, and we played outside with the neighborhood kids. We ran the neighborhood up and down. We rode bikes. Uh, we made up every game you can possibly imagine. Uh, it was Ghost in the Graveyard, it was TV Tag, it was Freeze Tag, it was all of those games. And one of the games that we made up that is my favorite is Invisible Baseball. <laughs> now, Invisible Baseball is exactly what it sounds like. There are no gloves, there's no bat, and there is no ball. Everything is invisible. The only thing you can see is your brother standing on the mound throwing you an invisible pitch. Now, when we watched, when we listened to Tiger games, we listened to them on the radio, WJR, Ernie Harwell. And Ernie Harwell could paint a picture like nobody else. You were at the game when Ernie called. So the job of the batter is to be the play-by-play -play guy. You have to paint the picture for everybody that's there. You're two brothers. So, now, in that time, we knew the starting lineup of every team in the National, I mean, in the American League and most of, the, most of the lineups in the National League. We knew what side of the plate they came from, we knew their stance, we knew their swing. And if you got up there as Lou Whitaker and you were batting from the right side, what are you doing? You're out. This is, why do you even try? It has to be realistic. Great, there's no ball, I get that, but you can't see the ball on the radio either. So you're Ernie Harwell, and you had to come up to the plate, and you had to call that. You had to paint that picture. You were an artist, right? So it, it, you took pitches, invisible pitches. You took balls inside. He tried to back me up. He's throwing at me. You would fall out. You would strike out. Now Patrick, on the right, he had a hard time with that. He tended to be the first pitch home run guy every time, and it would frustrate you so much. Because I just struck out as my favorite player, and you homer every time on the first pitch. Very frustrating. But David and I, we got it, and uh, and you would paint this picture. So it's one of my favorite things. Now we played that so much that on the house, uh, that at the house we lived in uh, Creek, the uh, which is just right up the road here, uh, it was just dirt in between the two bushes where home plate was. We played it so much. It was so much fun to play in the rain too, because when you stretch that imaginary single. You know, an imaginary double, you got to flop down and hug that fake base. But you slid half the way, it was fantastic. So now in 1983, we moved to Saline. <clears throat> and this is where everything sort of dives off the, off the map. Because those are the most stable and fun years of my life. 
Now, when we moved to Saline, this is in 1988, and I'm 17. So from 1983 to 1988, I live in seven different houses. We can't seem to catch a break. So it's, you know, one summer we're, we're in this house, and then for a year and a half we're in this house. And on top of that, Brian becomes smart, jumps ship, he moves to New York. My brother David joins the Army, and then Patrick, the last one, moves out and gets his own place. And so now it's just me, and everything is just falling apart. Nothing makes any sense, I have no direction, and everything that I like and care about is gone, it's gone to the winds. So now 1988 rolls around, and the Olympics are in Calgary, Alberta. And there's more uh, implausible sort of stories coming out of there. The Jamaicans, God love them, have a bobsled team. <laughs> And Eddie the Eagle is jumping for the Brits in the, in the long jump. It's not a long jump, but he does it. He's about half the distance of everybody else. Um, can't even see the hill he's jumping off of. He's got those Coke bottle glasses. But everybody loves him. It's a great story, right? We're all following it. And uh, then there's this other great story, Dan Jansen, who's the next Eric Hyde. He's going to inherit the title, right? He's a threat, triple threat for all these distances. And um, so we're following him. And three hours before he's supposed to skate in the preliminaries, his sister, uh, 27 years, uh, dies of leukemia. And she had been this major driving force. It's the whole media story. They pick up on it. It's this great tragedy. And he's going to be skating now. He's got this additional pressure for his sister. And uh, I remember, so in the first race, it's like the qualifiers. He doesn't even get out of the qualifying rounds. He falls. And um, it's devastating. And we're all crushed for him. But he's got more race. And uh, he comes out in the 1,000, and I remember he is at a record pace. They're talking about this is the Dan Jansen we know and love, right? And he still, he loses an edge again, and he falls. And now his Olympic dreams are they're done. They're over. And it's so, it's just not right. This is not the 1980 Olympics. This isn't the Four Tigers. This is not how sports stories go. You don't fall. What, what this is an injustice. It's, it's, I mean, it's outrageous. And I don't remember which one of us picked up on it first, but... It had to be corrected. Well, how are we going to do that? We are going to become Olympic skaters ourselves. We are going to dominate the sport of Olympic speed skating. These three brothers. Now, granted, I'm 17, and I'm the youngest. We're, look, we used to roller skate a lot. Every Friday and Saturday, right here at the World of Wheels, how much harder can it be? I mean, come on. We had CCM skates. We skated on a rink. We're halfway there. We've got these high-class uh, Meyer bikes here. We're, we're literally, we're ready. But we are serious about it. We are fired up because we are so passionate about this injustice and how it needs to be corrected that we are going to do this. And my, we're so serious that my father begins to call around. How do we make this happen? Where are they going to train? Well, it turns out that the U.S. Olympic training grounds are in Butte, Montana. So my father is calling around to find a place for us to live and train in Butte, Montana. Because we are going to do this. Now, I, when Brian approached me about this, I said, uh, I called Dad, and I said, Dad, were you really considering moving us to Butte? And he said, we were crazy. Why not? If it would have made you boys happy, I think we would have done it. Because we were, uh, we were dreamers. So we went out training on our bikes. We uh, hit the track, the high school uh, running track, a couple of times. This is one of those times. And my brother, who, who to this day claims that it was a ridiculous idea all the time, this is, when it hits and we get all the sponsorships, this is our ad. This is our Nike ad, right? When we sweep, because we even talked about, well, what, what event are you going to dominate? Well, I'm clearly the 500. Uh, David's the 1500. He's purely built for it. And Patrick's the thumb. So we just sweep. I'll take a bronze in the 1000. That's fine. I'll take the gold in 500, bronze, and I'll silver in the one in the 1500. Whatever. But this is, this is Brian's claim to fame right here. This is our, our... If we had won this Coke, the polar bear wouldn't exist. It'd still be this. Uh, just do it. Dreams do happen. This is it. Um, but... Um, I look back on it now and I realize that I dove into that head first uh, because I wanted my brothers back. I wanted my family back. I wanted focus. We were going to be in a location for four years. My brothers were going to be there uh, side by side. So this was like, this. I was in. I would have done anything. Um, so really what this photograph is to me is it's that kid in the middle 
and his desire to have just one more game of physical baseball. That's all I wanted. And that's that. So thank you.